Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Take a deep breath. Open your hearts and your minds. Let me rock and roll, and I'll throw it open for discourse at the end. I want to start with a quote from Martin Luther King. First, I'm going to put this microphone back on. We cool, Pat? Cool. All right. I want to start with a quote from Martin Luther King. He said, quote, wealth, poverty, racism, and war. These four always go together. Race, I'm sorry, wealth, poverty, racism, and war. These four always go together. So that's the theme, and you can just put that on the back burner, and that's the theme to percolate throughout the rest of what's going to happen today. I'm now, like a yin-yang, I want to balance that out with a poem I wrote for John Lennon. It goes like this. I am a golden, glowing, holy grail overflowing with pink, yellow, and blue rainbows to warm the hearts and smile the souls of all creatures, great and small. We are, one and all, the walrus. The flying firebombing of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon on September 11th, 2001, was America's first experience of the resentment and rage U.S. imperial foreign policy, U.S. imperial foreign policy, has generated around the world. Rather than seeing the event for what it meant, most Americans rallied around President George W. Bush and his cabal of war makers, who immediately exacerbated the problem by invading the Middle East. 3,000 U.S. citizens died in the attack on New York City. President Bush's immediate assault on Afghanistan killed more than 5,000 people, almost all of them innocent. Afghanistan did not attack the United States. Most of the 9-11 hijackers were Saudi Arabians, whose bin Laden relatives the Bush administration flew out of the United States before they could be interrogated while the rest of the country was grounded. President Bush utilized America's 9-11 tragedy as an opportunity to change Afghanistan's government, transforming that country into an American client state with a U.S.-appointed president who quickly signed a contract for UNICAL's oil pipeline through Afghani territory. Then in 2003, President Bush launched a preemptive war on Iraq, sacrificing American soldiers in another absurd war, killing many thousands of innocent Iraqis and installing a new government which, canceling French, Russian, and Chinese oil contracts, pledged allegiance to American and British exploitations of Iraqi oil. The Bush administration's accumulated lies justifying the attack on Iraq mirrored the deceit that led to and sustained America's Vietnam War, showing that American imperialism is alive and well and that the United States has yet to learn the lessons of history. When Albert Einstein publicly issued his Cold War warning in 1950, urging disarmament and an end to the madness of the American-Soviet arms race, he was issuing a collective call for peace and an end to the moral horror of turning places like Vietnam into sacrificial burning grounds for the settling of superpower conflicts. If Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson had listened to Einstein's warning, the Vietnam War would not have happened, 9-11 would not have happened, and we would not now be facing a future of more 9-11s and worse. Nevertheless, nevertheless, President George Bush Sr., Bush the first, declared while bombing Iraq in early 1991, quote, America has finally kicked the Vietnam syndrome, i.e., hesitation at the use of state-sanctioned violence. So we've kicked the Vietnam syndrome as far back as 1991. What does that mean? It means America no longer has to hesitate long enough to engage in 
legal and moral reflection before we act. Is it legal? Is it moral? No, we've kicked the Vietnam syndrome. Translate that into what it means. Thus did Mr. Bush Sr. make the voice of conscience, the people's will, the sound of protest, and moral common sense all sound like a disease. While proudly defending America's bombing of Iraq in order to save a dictator in Kuwait. In A People's History of the United States, Howard Zinn observes, quote, by the end of the Vietnam War, America's Vietnam War, seven million tons of bombs had been dropped on Vietnam alone. That's not counting Laos and Cambodia. More than twice the total bombs dropped on all of Europe and all of Asia in World War II. Almost one 500-pound bomb for every human being in Vietnam. Unquote. Yet, can, good timing. And thank you again for your patience and bearing with me and, you know, taking a deep breath every now and then and clearing your heart and mind and, and letting me finish, right? That's what democracy is about, free speech, right? You know? And then I'll throw it open for discourse at the end. I will be, I'll try to be provocative because I'm a philosopher and Socrates is my hero. And that's what philosophy is, it's questioning. If you don't question, you don't have a democracy. So I'm just throwing out a bunch of questions with a lot of historical backing up, I might say, right? Like a good philosopher. Okay, where were we? Um, okay, so let me just segue. All right, so Amer America dropped seven million tons of bombs, almost five, one 500 pound bomb for every human being in Vietnam. Okay, yet General William Westmoreland, one of the war's chief architects in a Time Magazine Man of the Year, would say, quote, he did say, quote, the Oriental doesn't put the same high price on life as does the Westerner. He goes on. In the Orient, life is plentiful. Life is cheap. And as the philosophy of the Orient expresses, life is not important. Unquote. General William Westmoreland. So we have to bond them into waking up and realize that life is important. How many people do we have to kill before they realize life is precious? That's the moral logic. Rational lunacy. Okay, thank you for bearing with me on that. During one of the largest peace marches in American history, April 17, 1965, at the foot of the Washington Monument, Paul Potter, president of Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, brought into clear view the implicit question in David Halberstam's book about the Vietnam War, The Best and the Brightest. So there, The Best and the Brightest, that's the title of the book. That's the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, especially Kennedy. And then most of them were in the Johnson, right? They're the best and the brightest. Right? There's a question there. And that is, are they? He says, Paul Potter said at the foot of the Washington Monument, I do not, quote, I do not believe that President Johnson or Secretary of State Dean Rusk or Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara or even National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy are particularly evil men. If asked to throw napalm on the back of a 10-year-old child, they would shrink in horror. But their decisions have led to mutilation and death of thousands and thousands of people. And that was in 65. The war went on for another 10 years. Make it millions. Here's the question. He ends. What kind of system, educational, economic, political, media, religious, what kind of cultural system is it that allows supposedly good men to make those kinds of decisions? Unquote. 
In his memoir, Busted, a Vietnam veteran in Nixon's America, W.D. Earhart notes, quote, the bodies of men, women, and children strewn hugger-mugger in thick piles in a ditch at the My Lai Massacre, gunned down by American boys like Jews in a Nazi concentration camp, had shown Americans something they had not wanted to see. Unquote. Earhart. Most Americans still do not want to see the consequences of their country's foreign policy. They do not want to hear voices of conscience like Earhart's or Mike Preisner's, or Michael Prenti or Noam Chomsky or Howard Zinn or Molly Ivins or Barbara Ehrenreich or Holly Sklar or Vandana Shiva or Naomi Klein. In George W. Bush's two terms as president, the lessons unlearned in Vietnam were repeated, were repeated in Iraq and Afghanistan. War correspondent Michael Hare makes an observation about the Vietnam War which applies to American intervention in South America, Africa, the Middle East, and other parts of the globe. Quote, I keep thinking about all the kids who got wiped out by 17 years of war movies before coming to Vietnam to get wiped out for good. There was such a dense concentration of American energy in Vietnam. American and essentially adolescent. If that energy could have been channeled into anything more than noise, waste, and pain, it would have lighted up Indochina for a thousand years. Unquote. Daniel Berrigan, scholar, priest, peace activist, and member of the Chicago Eight on trial for so-called disturbances at the 1968 Democratic National Convention, Daniel Berrigan coined a heartbreaking phrase to describe America's intervention in Vietnam. And you know my underlying thesis here. Our wars in Afghanistan on Iraq and Iraq are our second, it's Vietnam Redux. It's America's second Vietnam War. All the same lies, all the same consequences, all the same endless going on. All right, so Daniel Berrigan says, quote, no, actually, I'm quoting from, what am I quoting from? Nancy Zerulis and Gerald Sullivan's book, Who Spoke Up? American Protest Against the War in Vietnam, 1963 to 1975. So this is uh, Zerulis and Sullivan. Quote, early in 1968, Daniel Berrigan flew to Hanoi with Howard Zinn to bring back to the United States three prisoners of war that had been held captive in Hanoi, probably pilots shot down. While there in Hanoi, in North Vietnam, he saw the charred remains, pickled in jars, of Vietnamese victims of American bombing. Later that year, in his testimony at his trial for acts of peaceful protest against the war, Berrigan called Vietnam, quote, the land of the burning children. Unquote. Chomsky notes, quote, if the backroom boys, if the backroom boys, the CEOs, the stockholders, and all who work for them, but especially the managers in the back room, if the backroom boys at Dow Chemical were forced to walk through the burn ward of a children's hospital, they might think twice about what they are doing in their laboratories. Chomsky, uh, let's see, Chomsky adds, quote, Nixon and Kissinger were, were responsible for more bombing than any other leaders in the history of warfare. And by the time they came into office, the war should have been at least ended. The peace agreement finally signed in 73 mirrored that of 1968. W.D. Earhart says, quote, the division of Vietnam into North and South was nothing more than an artificial construction of the Western powers created at Geneva in 1954, at the Geneva Peace Conference after the end of the Korean War and pretty much, you know, then, then Vietnam. So they got together. Ngozin Zien had not been Eisenhower's miracle of democracy, but rather a tyrant hated by all but the Americans and a few upper-class French-educated Vietnamese Catholics. And I'd seen with my own eyes the filth and corruption and brutality of the Saigon regime in South Vietnam, supported by the US, first under Ngo Gao Ki and then under Nguyen Van Thu. 
Why hadn't I been told any of this before I'd gone to Vietnam as a U.S. Marine in 1967? No one had even suggested these things. Not my teachers or my church or the government or Time magazine. I had never imagined that the truth could be so ugly. In any nine-day period of Nixon's first term as president, more bombs fell on Indochina than in the entire five-and-a-half-year reign of Lyndon Johnson. It was the most vicious kind of war, war by proxy, a war mostly fought by the American government with the lives of Asians. It was a racist war, unquote, W.D. Earhart. Remember King? Wealth, poverty, racism, and war, they go together. And we cannot solve one without solving the other. As long as he fought for civil rights, he was allowed to live. It started, he was making connection between wealth, poverty, racism, and war. The entire system, how it functions. That's when they killed him. When he showed you how the dots connect. It's critical thinking. The rationalizations in Robert McNamara's 1996 memoir, In Retrospect, the tragedy and lessons of Vietnam. Remember, Robert McNamara, like Westmoreland, but McNamara even more, was one of the architects of the Vietnam War. He was Secretary of uh, Defense for John F. Kennedy at the beginning and, and through Lyndon Johnson right up until the beginning of 1968. The rationalizations in his book, his first major book about the war, the tragedy and lessons, exhibit, his book exhibits what Noam Chomsky calls, quote, an exercise in moral madness. An exercise in moral madness. Is that, does that name what's wrong with America? Does it need to be addressed? Does it need to get out of Plato's cave and say, this is moral madness. Not only what we're doing to other people and the countries, you know, other countries, but the planet. I'll get to that in the second part. Perhaps if McNamara had read the Pentagon Papers, which he commissioned, how the hell did we get into this mess? What's the history? If McNamara had read the Pentagon paper, which he didn't, he could have found his, maybe he could have found his conscience and his voice in early 1968. He might then have been tempted to lend his prestige and authority to the European War Crimes Tribunal, headed by British philosopher and peace activist Bertrand Russell and French philosopher activist Jean-Paul Sartre on the, on the issue of America's war in Vietnam. The tribunal concluded that the United States in Vietnam was guilty under the same laws America used to try Nazi generals at Nuremberg at the end of World War II, by the same criteria. Yet for all his war crimes, and unlike almost all of his peers then and since, Robert McNamara, in his retrospective study of the tragedy and lessons of America's Indochina Holocaust, had the courage to admit at the very end of his book, quote, we were wrong, terribly wrong. We owe it to future generations to explain why, unquote. He's right. At least he had the courage to admit it. Did we learn it? No. Vietnam War all over again, this time in the Middle East, with countries surrounded by nuclear weapons and seething with hatred. In a Kissingerian world of Machiavellian geopolitics, the United States actually won its war against Vietnam and its Cambodian Laotian neighbors. They, the United States did not achieve its maximal objectives, but it actually won the war insofar as it achieved its major objectives. The countries of Southeast Asia remain among the poorest of the world. That's what they wanted. No economic competitors for Japan and the Philippines and whoever else the U.S. was supporting. Too busy rebuilding after the most vicious and sustained onslaught in human history, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia represent not the slightest threat to America's economic or military empire. Second major objective. Third, they did not want Vietnam or Laos and Cambodia any more than Cuba or Nicaragua or Angola, to represent a social democratic viable middle way like Scandinavia and Iceland, mostly, right? between capitalism and communism. 
They want us to think that freedom means capitalism, and it doesn't. Those two notions need to be real freedom is regulated capitalism, where the government serves the people, not the corporations. It's real simple. Capitalism and communism both have extremes on either side, but there's a middle way, of course. That's the balance, always the key to life. Too busy rebuilding after the most vicious and sustained onslaught in human history, Indochina represents not the slightest threat to America's empire, economic, political, or military. The cost in lives, both Asian and American, was and is perceived as utterly inconsequential by America's political, military, and corporate elite. The tragic irony of America's war against Southeast Asia is that the achievement of its major objectives allowed the U.S. government to sustain the illusion that political deception and the application of military force are necessary and are right. Result? America's wars against Afghanistan and Iraq. Vietnam Redux. Galvanizing anti-American hatred throughout the world. Threatening the Middle East with another apocalypse now. And steadily turning into a global conflict. Chomsky puts the matter succinctly when he says we have a simple choice, hegemony or survival. We can rule the world or the human race can survive. Chomsky's insight echoes the prophecy of Martin Luther King, quote, we must choose between nonviolence and non-existence. We must choose between nonviolence and non-existence. There are no other choices. That's it. That's not the end of my lecture, but that's it. <laughs> okay, so this is part two. We're doing pretty good on time. This will go a little quicker, actually. So maybe a little more fun in some ways. We'll see. Found a, all day yesterday, I, I knew I was going to find a feather. Because I wrote a poem recently called Heart Like a Feather to remind me, like, yes, I'm angry and passionate and outraged, right? But be, be cheerful, meditative, heart like a feather, you'll be fine, right? So all day, yes, I knew I was going to find a feather. All the way here, all the way back as I walk, no, right? So I forgot about it. <laughs> and then today I'm walking here, so I'm sort of meditating. I got my, spent most of the night, you know, working out my notes. Got a, you know, good number of hours sleep. Got some food, you know, I'm cool. Walk in here, and uh, right before I get here, there's this tiny little feather on the ground. Look how small it is. But there it is. It came, you know? And all day yesterday, I was wondering, I was sure I was going to find that feather. Why didn't I find that? Where is it, right? So as soon as I forgot about it, it appeared, oh, during your lecture, right? Just, you know, just remember, <laughs> right? So I'll be provocative, but hopefully not too infuriating. OK, so this is part two. New World Order Blues. I'm just calling it New World Order Blues, because Bruce was kind enough to mention at the end of that very gracious introduction. Thank you, Bruce. Item number 16, which I gave him all those items. And I said, 16 was the number on my baseball uniform for years. So I, I'm going to go for 16. Right? I had 15 I had it, right? It was a. Uh, Coyote Chris and I have a CD out, and the CD ends with uh, this rock and roll hip hop song called New World Order Blues. Because after the fall of the Cold War, you know, Reagan defeated communism, America's number one, Cold War's over, end of history, we can create a new world. <laughs> and it's like, you know, the more it changes, the more it stays the same. So I call this New World Order Blues. All right. I want to start with a quote from Karl Marx quote, the demand to abandon illusions about our condition is a demand to abandon the conditions which require illusion. Got it? You don't, I mean, I'm, right? The demand to abandon illusions about our condition is a demand to abandon the conditions which require illusion. Okay. So now I want to quote William Bloom, author of the best book ever written in the English language on the history of the CIA, called Killing Hope. It's been out for 50 years and keeps getting somewhat updated. Um, and, and his new book of essays in the last few years, uh, Freeing the World to Death. I want to quote William Bloom, B-L-U-M. If I were president. So, you know, go ahead and I'm going to invoke the spirit of John, John Lennon. I want you to imagine if I was president. 
Right? John Lennon says, imagine. So do it. If that doesn't make you smile, I don't know what will. All right, so see if this would be true. But I'm quoting William Bloom. If I were the president, I if I were the president, I could stop terrorist attacks against the United States in a few days, permanently. I would first apologize very publicly and very sincerely to all the widows and orphans, the impoverished and the tortured, and all the many millions of other victims of American imperialism. Then I would announce to every corner of the world that America's global military interventions have come to an end. Then I would dismantle the American empire with set over 700 military bases around the world, reduce the military budget by at least 90%, and use the savings, turn swords into plowshares, and use the savings to pay reparations to the victims and repair the damage from the many American bombings, invasions, and sanctions. One year's American military budget is equal to more than $20,000 per hour for every hour since Jesus Christ was born. That's just one year. So this is what I would do on my first three days in the White House. On the fourth day, I'd be assassinated. President Obama gave a speech on Memorial Day, May 28, 2012, in front of the Vietnam Memorial Wall in Washington, D.C. He announced a 13-year project entitled The Vietnam War Commemoration. The Vietnam War Commemoration Campaign. Obama's speech was delivered to a cheering, very carefully selected group of Vietnam veterans. The alleged purpose of the project is to rehabilitate the image of Vietnam veterans in America's collective consciousness. The 13-year extravaganza will consist of a series of well-funded national and local events. These events will number in the thousands across the country over the next 13 years. The Vietnam War commemoration campaign was an idea spawned in the Bush-Cheney administration. The planned festivities are a Pentagon propaganda campaign designed to keep American citizens in Plato's cave. So beware. As an instrument in the national security state's arsenal of weapons of mass dysfunction, WMDs, the real WMDs, weapons of mass dysfunction, how they keep people dysfunctional inside Plato's cave, huh? As an instrument in the national security state's arsenal of weapons of mass dysfunction, the Vietnam commemoration campaign is Orwell's 1984 come true. The commemoration kaleidoscope of heroic imagery and patriotic fervor seeks to seduce the next generation of youth into sacrificing their lives in the upcoming wars in which they will be used again as intentionally ignorated taxpayer finance thugs for America's richest corporations. That's its purpose. Taxpayers will finance the military, and the military will go whatever Wall Street tells Washington to. We need the oil. We, need, we want the rubber. We want the rainforest. Whatever it is. We want the banks, no matter where they are. Our dear, miseducated, and supposedly Judeo-Christian children will be offered up, as they are today in, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq and in lots of other places around the world. Right? Our dear, miseducated, and supposedly Judeo-Christian children will be offered up and sacrificed on the altar of American military adventurism to perpetuate a moral contradiction called democratic imperialism, whose folly mirrors the Athenian fleet sailing to Syracuse, the pivot in the Peloponnesian War leading to Athenian disaster and failure. The VVAW, Vietnam Veterans Against the War, still active, is launching a people's counter campaign to educate the American people. It is called the Vietnam War Commemoration Correction Project. The goal of this people's counter campaign is to keep America's memory honest, to keep us tethered to our history and the lessons therein. And as we hurtle toward a trifecta from hell, diminishing resources, nuclear proliferation, and global klepto-capitalism, hopefully we can keep America somewhere 
in the moral ballpark. To honor the memory and sacrifice of American troops in Vietnam, the living and the dead, the traumatized in body and soul, we must tell the truth about how they were betrayed by their leaders and by the institutions of their culture. The light of this truth is our only hope for dismantling the war machine, committing to peace, and never again asking our youth for such deluded, death-dealing obedience. We can educate, love, and revere our children instead, and thus collectively act as a beacon of hope for the world. We can do it. That's what the Founding Fathers and the Revolutionary Soldiers fought for. We can do it. Reporter, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? Gandhi, I think it would be a good idea. Noam Chomsky, the problem is not that people don't know. It's that they don't know they don't know. Because if they knew they didn't know, they would maybe, then they could find out. Maybe at least make an effort. You don't even know you don't know. You're just like, give me American Idol, mixed martial arts, the Super Bowl, whatever. Karl Krauss, quote, how do wars start? Politicians lie to journalists and then believe what they read. Mark Twain, America's flag should be a skull and crossbones. Mark Twain, America's flag should be a skull and crossbones. He said that during the so-called Spanish-American War. No American ever went to war with Spain. Spain was leaving and we just gobbled up Puerto Rico, Cuba, Guam, and the Philippines. It was this empire building. It wasn't a war with Spain. And Mark Twain was appalled. It's not supposed to be what America's about. He wanted to put skull and crossbones up. <laughs> right? Bush and Cheney, you're a traitor. We'll throw your ass in prison. How dare you? Howard Zinn, the truth is so often the opposite of what we are told, we can no longer turn our heads around far enough to see it. America is so much like Plato's cave in the Matrix. Thanks largely to the American system of compulsory miseducation in the United States of amnesia, John Lennon felt obliged to write the lyric, they torture and scare you for 20 odd years then they expect you to pick a career." Unquote. Nietzsche said, quote, this nation has made itself stupid on purpose. Nietzsche said that about Germany 120 years ago. It's never been more true of America. Norman Mailer said it better than anyone in the last century, and I'm paraphrasing. America's deepest moral contradiction is that we call ourselves a Christian nation, yet worship at the altar of prophets. You show me in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus says, blessed are the bankers, blessed are the rich, blessed are the shoppers. Remember George Bush after 9-11? Oh, the terrorists are after us. I know how to solve the problem. Let's go shopping. America's deepest moral contradiction, the one that has to be addressed to solve all the others. This is what Martin Luther King was talking about. War, peace, the Pentagon budget, racism, poverty, schools, Business itself? America's deepest moral contradiction is that we call ourselves a Christian nation yet worship at the altar of profit. We bow to the wisdom of turning swords into plowshares on the weekends, yet have the largest empire and war machine in history. Most Americans don't even know there is such a thing as the American empire. Do you know that? And yet they pay for it. I mean, how cool is that? Say those who own, right? They don't even know they don't know. Empire, that's the commies, that's not us. Um, and yet, because we know we're fooling ourselves, right? Subconsciously, subliminally, right? You can't call yourself a Jew or a good Christian or a good Muslim and worship at the altar of prophet. You just can't do it. You know you're in bad faith. You know you're, you're absurd. You're worshiping the absurd, so you rationalize. And yet we know, we are troubled as morphia. If we would listen to that inner call, you know, we're all troubled like that splinter in the brain. If we would listen to that, unplug from the matrix and like, what is that saying, right? We are troubled as morphia said, like a splinter in the brain. We could wake up. Philip Caputo's experience, he was a soldier. 
Philip Caputo's experience in Vietnam foreshadows Iraq and Afghanistan. Quote, there was nothing familiar out where we were, no churches, no police, no laws. It was the dawn of creation in the Indochina bush, an ethical as well as a geographical wilderness. Out there, lacking restraints, sanctioned to kill, confronted by a hostile country and relentless enemy, we sank into a brutish state. Once I had seen pigs eating napalm chom Once I had seen pigs eating napalm charred corpses. A memorable sight, pigs eating roast people. Unquote, unquote. Today we hurtle toward a trifecta from hell, environmental despoliation, nuclear proliferation, and global kleptocapitalism. Not to mention the fact that the United States is the largest arms seller in the world. We'll never have peace as long as the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, the US, Britain, France, Russia, and China, right? Are the five, they're, they're the Security Council of the United Nations. What are they doing there? To secure peace in the world, to resolve things by negotiation, right? Before it breaks, security. Secure the world against the horrors of World War I and World War II. We don't have to repeat it. Let's think first, let's talk first, right? And the five members of the, the, five members of the Security Council are the five largest arms sellers in the world. Just profiting off the arms business. That's a moral contradiction that has to be addressed. The New York Times never says it. Wall Street Journal never says it. It's just like where all the money goes. It should be on the front page every day until this country like changes it and doesn't need to be there. All right. Um, so today we hurtle toward a trifecta from hell, environmental despoliation, nuclear proliferation, global kleptocapitalism, all related to the arms race and the ecological destruction of the planet. Leon Trotsky said, quote, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. Plato anticipates H.G. Wells. History is more and more a race between education and catastrophe. We're the only country in the world whose national anthems has rockets and bombs going off. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men, Liberty and justice for all? That's why they call it the American dream. You have to be asleep to believe it. There are no passengers on Spaceship Earth. We are all members of the crew. We are brothers and sisters in the global village. The secret meaning of relativity theory is that we are, in fact, all related. Quantum theory has known this for a hundred years. It is time for our culture to transform itself accordingly. I believe we can. I do. I know we can. I believe we will. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. A very long time ago, a very, very long time ago, Humanity embraced a spirituality of organic, organic interbeing, honoring mothers and Mother Earth because nature and women give birth. Men can't do that. That's why men feel jealous and inferior. To compensate for those feelings, too many men bully women, bully nature, and compete with each other to be king of the hill. And now here we are with nuclear weapons, waste and proliferation as religious hatred and shrinking resources provoke the dogs of war. We are about to lose our one and only spaceship. How sane is that? Women's liberation should really be called men's liberation. Men's liberation is our only hope for survival. There is, of course, no going back. We hurtle toward the future. Fortunately, the women's liberation movement came along just in time, joining hands with the peace movement, the civil rights movement, the anti-nuclear movement, and the environmental movement. 
the voluntary simplicity movement, a new age, Aquarian, egalitarian. In that spirit, allow me now to share with you, and I'm just about done, my, revi my revised version of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the planet and to all the people and creatures on her, one ecosystem, universally sacred, with nourishment and beauty for all. And now I want to share a bumper sticker. And then I'm going to pose a topic and a question and toss it out to you. All right, so I said we're just about done. We've got a full 20 minutes of discourse if we want. Um, so thank you for your attention. You've been a fabulously attentive audience, which I really appreciate. Um, okay, bumper sticker. Women, this is my favorite bumper sticker. <laughs> Women who seek to be equal to men lack ambition. My other favorite bumper sticker is, or one of them is, uh, God is coming, and boy, is she mad. All right. All right, so here's the topic, then the question. And that, you know, the question is, um, you know, I'm just going to toss it out to you, and just let it sink in, you know, to, and let it go onto the back burner and percolate as I, and I'm going to conclude by just elaborating on the question a little bit, and then sharing a, an extremely short, short story, which is a true story, okay? And then by that time, the question will have percolated, and I'll throw it open and we can talk, okay? Okay. All right. So here's the topic. Women in combat. Here's the question. What would Martin Luther King say? Okay. Here's my elaboration, then I'll tell the story. But we'll, and then we'll return to that question, because I want to know what you think. Okay. Women in combat. Would Martin Luther King that would, Lark, would Martin Luther King think that is an enlightened and virtuous step on the path to truly civil rights? Civil rights means being civil, right? Civil means peaceful, cooperating, right? Women in combat. Is that what the women's liberation movement was all about? so that women would have equal opportunity to kill and maim and be killed on behalf of Wall Street? What would Martin Luther King say? Okay, so my friend Louis Randa, the founder and director of the Life Experience School for Challenged Children and the Peace Abbey, and creator of the uh, Peace Abbey Courage and Conscience Award and uh, the National Registry of Conscientious Objection. Um, so, uh, so I was debating whether or not to uh, really bring up this topic of women in combat, and there are reasons for that which some of you might not know. Okay, but we, maybe we can get into it if you wonder about why I hesitated. <laughs> I debated it all day yesterday, and then I got a letter from, and I sent Lewis a poem, and then he sent me this response. Um, so now I'm just going to read the response. So it's a true story, okay? So just hang, 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 with, hang there, in there with me. All right. So Lewis says, and the poem ended with, uh, the poem I sent him ended with uh, the lady of the lake holding a lotus whose petals were opening as she rode a white horse around the ring. That's how the poem ended, right? So his response begins. Right, so bear with me. This is it. This is the end. As you ride the white horse around the ring, let... Let them, you, <laughs> let them not forget that the rationale of upper body strength women supposedly lack, which was one of the reasons used for keeping women out of combat, as they'd be unable to carry their male comrades if wounded in the battlefield, misses entirely the point that the upper moral strength women possess, without question which is sorely needed to carry men from their obsession with war, is the greatest contribution, their moral strength is the greatest contribution women can make in the combat for a truly peaceable kingdom. 
i.e. to keep men and themselves and child soldiers and conscripted adolescents out of combat, not to join them in it. Today America is celebrating the fact that, you know, <laughs> women can now go into combat. Like it's a great triumph in civil rights. Yeah. It's not your physical prowess, it's your moral superiority to lunatic male chauvinist pigs. Right? Set the example. Right? So as he says, you know, uh, women, please, keep men as well as yourselves and child soldiers and conscripted adolescents out of combat. Right? Not join them in it. What the fuck? I'm quoting. <laughs> what the fuck? Which I'm sure Martin Luther King must have said on many occasions. Right? Right? What the fuck? Okay, so then he ends, and then this is the end. So he ends, I'll just read it. This is, Have fun tonight, meaning today. Because right? I, I got this this morning. So I, Have fun tonight, and whatever you do, don't get the women in the audience angry. Wear a protective cover. Duck like W did when shoes were thrown at him. OxyClean gets tomato juice out of clothing. Stay behind the podium at all times. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention, Ari. That was great. <laughs> so I'm willing. So okay. So I want to just start with that question and get you know some feedback. What do you think? What would Martin Luther King say? You kind of know what I would say, right? You, okay. um, Julie. Yeah, Gandhi, pardon me for interrupting, but if I don't, you know how I'm right. I don't remember. Uh, yeah, so um, Gandhi said uh, one of the great sayings, right? an eye for an eye only makes the whole world blind. It's like after 9 11. You know? An eye for an eye only. Hesitate, please, consider. There's options, it really is. You know, just because somebody robs a bank in Boston doesn't allow Washington to, you know, invade and bomb Massachusetts. They don't. 9-11, it was just the equivalent of sort of a, a kind of a bank robbery. You go after the gang. You don't invade. Right? All right. Yes, Julie. I was just like, I mean, you say how adding more women to combat is not necessarily bad. Like, you know, you can have more people in the military and they don't Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Uh, I yes. I think Martin Luther King, I think he would say, judge not people by the empty content of, uh, or by the content of empty rhetoric. Rather by the content of their soul. We live in an era of all volunteer service. If women want to serve, yeah. let them serve. If they bring peace to the battlefield, they bring it. My experience is women have been sending men and joining them in wars forever and will continue to do so. Very well said. <laughs> Very well said. And, um, you know, we can agree to disagree, but I understand what you're saying and I'm open to it. And, and you know, one thing that you've given me the opportunity to clarify is, you know, um, it's not, I'm not coming down on the soldiers. You know, my main critique, whether the soldiers are men or women, you know, I think women can also serve in, in a military that's like doing good. But when the military is sent for, you know, based on lies, whether it's Vietnam or the Bush line about weapons of mass destruction and Iraqi involvement in 9 11, I mean, no, women, don't join that, please. You know, the wars in the Middle East are all about oil. So, you know, we need a military, and, and it's, you know, so I don't know exactly what the solution is, but thank you for that. Yes, somebody else. That's it? No questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I can't really speak on what Martin Luther King would say, because I, uh, I wouldn't say I studied in that subject as most people here might be, but uh, I'm actually a veteran myself. I got back from Afghanistan in March of last year, and. Um, what I will say is that there's a great misconception that women in the military have already served in combat. Um, I myself, I'm an infantryman. Um, that's like the boys club of the army. Uh, that wasn't allowed even up until, you know, even with, even with this 
surpassing the, the, to my understanding, women are not going to be allowed in the infantry. They will be able to serve in combat roles such as combat medics and uh, they might not be on the front lines with us, but there's, there's this misconception that women have never been in combat before this point in time, and it isn't true. Um, while I was in Afghanistan, actually, we had women who served with us. Yeah. Um, and the same is true in Vietnam, too. I mean, the, that, in every war, women end up getting, you know, risking their lives, being killed in combat in one way or another around the fridges. Now it's just more, you know, Congress passes legislation, and, it's, you know, so it's, we're heading more in that direction. But yeah, you're absolutely right. And if anybody doubts that women are wounded in America's wars, just go visit the Veterans Administration and all the hospitals around the country. You'll see men and women with, with with injuries that would you would you would, would shrink in horror, you'll want to shriek in horror. It will drive you nuts. That's why people don't do it. That's why it's not on the media. And that's just our own soldiers, our own men and women. You know? Like Daniel Berrigan visited, you know, go visit the, the Napalm children in Vietnam. You know? So Yes, sir. It bothers the question that to the young ladies here in a slightly different direction. Sure. Uh, also, as a veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan, it, regardless if you consider a step forward for equality, sideways, backwards, I, I okay. don't know. Uh, right. uh, that's, that's a personal decision. But right now, as I said, it's an all volunteer force. But what do you young ladies think about women in frontline combat activities when we go back to a conscripted army? And will it be okay if you're crafted to serve the front line? that change the, the, the shade of equality of civic? Well, well, I, well that's a great question. That's going to sink in and percolate. And so, yeah. you know, even though there's no immediate response, people are going to go home with that, and I thank you for that, because, you know, that's what this is all about, raising good questions, and there's good questions on both sides. And, you know, as a philosopher, I would want us to think about the different meanings of equality. There's not just one level or definition of equality. You know, and think about what would Martin Luther King say or, or Jesus. George W. Bush was asked, you know, who's, who's, your, who's your favorite political hero? You know, what's, who, you know, he said Jesus. So what would Jesus say? So um, anything else? Yes, ma'am. And we, can, we don't have to stay on the Martin Luther King women in combat issue. I just wanted to get it started and make sure I concluded with that. Because Lewis said, I know you're going to raise that issue. So. I'm Oh yeah, I am, that's right. And it, with this, this was originally scheduled in the Martin Luther King room, so that gave, I was gonna invoke his spirit. <laughs> so I, I think he's here anyway, even though there's no pictures. Yes, ma'am. I'm just curious, you said something like, if the military were doing good, it would support when you join the military, getting into the military. Can you talk about what the good things are? Yeah, dismantle the American military and bring all those soldiers home from all from 700 military bases around the world. Now, I don't mean necessarily close them all. There's always you know, some compromise somewhere to live, right? But it will way off to one extreme and it needs to be balanced out. So all those soldiers around the world, stop building more American military bases all across Africa and Central Asia. That's not the way to peace, right? Um, so bring the soldiers home and have them do environmental cleanup. Have them build schools, parks, playgrounds medical centers, have them help with the infrastructure, bridges, roads. There's a lot to be done, and our tax dollars are paying them to be around the world. No, most of what they're doing is it's just making the world not a safer place. It's making the world safe for the Fortune 500. That's the tragedy, that's the irony, that's what most people, Americans don't realize. They're always thinking, you know, when the, when the government or the, and the media, you know, shouts, boogeyman, boogeyman, boogeyman. Oh, it's Gaddafi. Oh, it's Saddam Hussein. Oh, it's Osama bin Laden. Oh, it's Noriega. Gaddafi going to get you. I mean, before Ronald Reagan even came out with it, most people couldn't even identify Libya on a map, let alone, you know. Gaddafi going to get you. And then within a month, everybody, Gaddafi, Gaddafi. Gaddafi is in the closet. Gaddafi is under the bed. Gaddafi going to get your mama. All right? And then Reagan bombs Libya, killed one of his adopted daughters. And a, a month, six months later, the, the New York Times printed on page 28 at the bottom, oh, by the way, the evidence that Ronald Reagan held up to justify our bombing of, of Libya 
which said that the CIA had indisputable proof that, that Muammar Gaddafi had sent assassination squads into America to kill political leaders, right? So we bombed it, right? Better not, right? And then the New York Times said, page 28 at the bottom, right? oh, that was a CIA fabrication, not true at all. But they're experts at that. You know? They'll plant stories in the foreign news, and then our media or the politicians will go, well, it says in, you know, this brick, right? Oh. Anyway. Well, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I think at this point it's not really a question of quality or peace because there's no true definition of quality. I think it's more so everyone is so focused on fighting and who can, who can do what. Like now, like, when we be in combat, I would do it, the man do it. I don't think that it would be the same, like you said, if it would be drafted. But in terms of volunteer, everyone thinks, oh, because it's evil. There's no true definition. Yeah, as a philosopher, I agree with you. We need to deconstruct words like equality or civil rights. So civil and then even rights, all different kinds of layers and meanings of rights, what kind of rights, you know? Environmental rights, political rights, educational rights, economic rights, you know? So yeah, I totally agree. It's all worth debating. That's why I love philosophy. You can just get right down into the heart of language and dig out the meanings and you know, try to go from there. And it's never, you know, 100% certain. We live with probability patterns. So, anybody else? Yes, uh, John. I, I would like to go back to the question our friend in the back asked, uh, because I think it's a very good question, and it, it, should, it should make us think. If there was a draft, would it be more or less likely that Americans would be a sympathetic uh, uh, Oblivious to what's going on in, in, in right now in Afghanistan and in the Middle East. That's one thing. I mean, go back to Vietnam. During the Vietnam, the Vietnam War, there was, there, was, there was a draft, and people were much closer to what was happening. It seems like right now, people just don't even know what's happening. And question number two is what if women were being drafted? Yeah. Would that be more or less likely that we would still be there? I mean, maybe it's less. I think that's an absolutely superlative point, and I think you are, you know, very constructively building on the ideas that the gentleman introduced. Very constructive. And the irony is, you know, I, I think you're right. I'm not for the draft. I mean, why anybody would trust the American government and give them the right to end, you know, to make decisions on life and death over you? You know, I'm definitely not for the draft. You know, especially if you look at, you know. Like Vietnam, all those kids that were drafted to fight a totally immoral war. Um, but if we had, but yes, absolutely, absolutely, this is a superb point and worth thinking about. If America, you know, reinstalls the draft, right, and also now, especially, right, or is drafting women and sending them to Afghanistan, these wars are probably, in the Middle East, would probably be over. That's really true. It, it definitely was a factor in the ending of the Vietnam War. It was. And the ending of the draft, so-called, in the lottery system, you know, it's like, um, there's a lot of factors involved. But that's a superb point. It's absolutely superb. Uh, yes? Um, but do we need draft to stop being ignorant about wars? Well, that's kind of, yeah. I call that tragic irony, yeah. right? Our times might be so tragic that, that it takes, you know, the tragedy of drafting, you know, drafting sons and daughters of everybody, not the super rich, they'll always get out of it, right? And, you know, then their parents would be like, wait a minute, no, no. So, yeah. Did I see another hand? Yes. I'm not sure I understand your question. Do you, do you want to respond? John, you started this. Yeah, I, I wonder if women would put up with what's going on if they were the ones being drafted. But, I mean, women put up with it when their sons were being drafted during the Vietnam War. But I was just wondering, would it be that, you know, in this day and age, if women were being drafted, maybe they would try to, you know, insert some pressure on the government to 
Yeah, it might take a draft of, of men and women and sending them over to wake people up. That could be the tragic irony of our times, it might be. But you know, we don't have to wait for that. No. By all means, you know, women just stop giving men sex. <laughs> just do it. The wars will end in a month. Right? And that includes people, you know, just don't give sex to the men. If they're in Dow Chemical, you're making napalm, you're making bombs. No! You have the power. <laughs> you do. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Peace out. That was great. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did.